So today's topic is some essential questions. The topic could be very simple because we all put questions to ourselves. In fact, uh, one major distinction between human beings and the rest of the creation is the ability to put some questions. Questions about life. Whether life is mere existence or is it a meaningful process, a creative, constructive process. Animals exist, the organic world exists, mountains and valleys, stones and trees, they all exist. Is human, exist, human life different from those things? That's the question. There are different views about life and creation. Sometimes we interpret life as a creation by God those who believe in creationism. There are different schools of Genesis descriptions of creation, different traditions, the Genesis in the Bible. And again, there is a passage in the Yajurveda, which is almost some kind of a Sanskrit equivalent of Genesis. So, Kamayada, Bhakushyam Prajayedi, Satapota Pyada, Satapastapta, Idam Sarva Masrajada, Satsrushtu, Atadeva, Anuprabhishat. The first paragraph is nothing but Bible. The much earlier, that's all. God so willed, here also, He willed, let me become many. And then the world was created. And instead of saying, God breathed the soul into the nostrils of man, the Upanishad, Taitiri Upanishad, which is from Yajurveda, says God entered into his own creation. So this is one view, that God created this world. Of course, please remember, this is not the view of Vedanta, non-dualistic school of philosophy, but this is the view of the popular Hinduism, the monotheistic Hindu tradition, which is in many ways close to any other Abrahamic monotheistic belief systems. Then there are many other modern thinkers who believe the world is just an accident. Life is an accident. It's called the school of accidentalists. In fact, there was an ancient school of creationists who believed that creation is an accident. In fact, Jains belong to that school. Vardhamana Mahavira who was born in the 6th century BC, who is the founder of um, Jaina religion, which influenced Gandhi and his thought systems. He believed that world is an accident. Life is an accident. Then there are many others, even today, the humanists and the rationalists, they believe that life is just a natural phenomenon. Fire is hot because that is nature. There is no need to go in search of a cause or an explanation. Water is cold. That's its own inherent nature. It's called Prakriti Vada or naturalism. Then there are innumerable schools who look upon this phenomenon of life from different angles. There are those who believe that it is a predetermined, pre-programmed process. An intelligence is put into a machine and the machine works according to <coughs> that programming. They, they, they used to be called, in ancient India, they used to be called Niyeti Vadinaka. Niyeti means destiny, fate. So those who explain life and existence and creation in the light of destiny or predetermination were called Niyadi Vadinaka. In fact, even today you find many people believe that everything is predetermined. Most Abrahamic theological traditions 
subscribe to this view. Everything is destiny. Now, in this context, the first question that I put before you again reemerges. What is life? Is it mere existence which could be interpreted in different ways? Or is it a, a creative, constructive process that we begin with birth, going through different stages and experiences, and there is a, an inherent, a transcendental, a divine, a creative, constructive purpose and meaning and relevance behind this phenomenon of life. That's the view of Vedanta. Vedanta believes that we come from perfection and we are moving towards perfection and this intermediary stage is called life. That you find in many Abrahamic traditions, of course, echoes of this view, not exactly as such. For example, uh, the Adam at the apple, and that was the cause of the fall, and now we had to take um, refuge in Jesus, and then we'll get back to our real nature. So we are coming from a higher dimension and we are going towards a higher dimension this intermediary process is called life which is by its very nature imperfect so the first important characteristic or the unique characteristic of human beings which distinguishes them from the animal kingdom is the ability to recognize that there is something imperfect in this psychophysical mechanism. There is something imperfect, something which has a scope for improvement in this physical existence. That's a dividing line between the world of organisms, the world of anim animal kingdom, and the human beings. Now, Swami Vivekananda, in his own style, gives a very interesting definition to the concept of yoga. He says, there is a constant evolution. Evolution not at the physical level, evolution at the higher spiritual or cultural level, evolution at the level of values. Yoga is a process that brings out the human from the animal and the divine from the human. The yoga is that collect, that that conscious effort at the transcendental plane, when we control the senses, when we are able to redirect our senses and mind, when we are no more enslaved by the temptations of sensory pleasures, when we are able to say no to the temptations of the senses, when we are able to give a spiritual orientation to our activities, thoughts, words, everything, then we move from the human to the divine. So bringing out this divine from the human or to raise the human to the divine spiritual dimension is what yoga is all about. This is the definition that Swami Vivekananda gave to the, the, I mean, the spiritual practice known as yoga. That's why he gives two very significant definitions. One definition is the definition that he gave to the process of education. The other is the definition of religion. Interestingly, both are interrelated. Education, according to Vivekananda, is the manifestation of perfection already in man. This word already has to be underlined. That's what distinguishes it from the radical definition which John Locke gave based on the concept of tabula rasa. Every child, human child, is born with an empty slate, an empty board. You can write whatever you want. You can scroll. 
you can deface his destiny and you can also write wonderful things wonderful spiritual truths on that empty board the slate tabula rasa now according to vivekananda and according to many modern educationists a child is not born with an empty slate he is born with a slate which is it is already written on he is born with a inner content the content of his own consciousness he is born with certain characteristics tendencies impressions that that individual being might have gathered from previous life innumerable previous life so he is born with a burden which we call the subtle body or the sukshma sharira his real personality is n- not the human mechanism see uh, when we normally understand human beings we try to uh, understand or analyze him or her on the basis of the external aspect of the personality pravedanta says behind and beyond the ex- this external which is only an outer shell there is a deeper and higher dimension which is what is called sukshma sharira which is the sum total of all the impressions tendencies samskaras vasanas that that individual being might have gathered not only in this life but innumerable past life that's why we suddenly feel like well this is a meditation center let us end at there because sometime in the past if not in this life maybe 2000 bc we may have meditated for some time and today when we pass through the streets when we find a church or a temple a meditation center we see the board written to oh let me go and meditate that's because even if you have not meditated for the last 2000 years under for hundreds of lives if you have meditated maybe in 3000 bc 5000 years back this impression this impressions which are gathered within our system connects with that board bill board that is written in the meditation center lord krishna explains this in a very telling verse in the 6th chapter those of you are interested tatradam buddhi samyogam labhade paurvadehigam yadadeja tado bhuya samsiddho kurunandana I won't go into the whole episode because I have explained this quite a few times earlier. This sixth chapter, Lord Krishna explains this process. If we have done something good, something noble, something that is conducive to your own spiritual life, and then you couldn't do much, you passed away. Over the next hundreds of lives, maybe for two thousand years, you could not do anything. this this samskara this tendency this impression which is conducive to spiritual life will connect with an external circumstance an external condition if the external conditions are conducive to spiritual life then there is a connection a connection is made between our subtle personality the men mind stuff and this external circumstances and we continue doing the same that is that is tatradam buddhi samyogam labhade paurva dehigam words are very important these samskaras you gathered with the help of a body which you had some time in the past and it is it is stored in the buddhi in the mind stuff and that reemerges when there is an external stimuli which is conducive to this and they connect and will continue our spiritual journey now if you understand this then you'll understand life is not a mere existence life is a process life is a creative constructive process the big challenge that we face in modern times is the pursuit of pleasure 
we suppose different from happiness pleasure is certainly different from happiness all pleasurable experiences do not give us happiness more very often they give us pain but this pursuit of pleasure with the help of science and technology developments in information developments in different knowledge systems often uh, conceal some of these inherent spiritual tendencies and project some other harmful tendencies tendencies that we may have gathered which may not be helpful for spiritual life that's the answer which vedanta gives so once we try to keep our efforts to revive these inherent spiritual tendencies then we can continue our spiritual journey so there is an interesting episode in this connection from an ancient spiritual classic it's called bhagavata purana it's related to life love karma rebirth everything there was a king and he didn't have children and it seemed that he prayed for a long time to god and uh, bec- uh, and then god blessed him and he had a son and the prince was healthy intelligent well educated and uh, the king finally decided to declare him as the heir apparent in those days kings and emperors when they get old they used to go they used to village to retire to forest hermitages the queen and the king and spent the rest of their lifetime in meditation and contemplation leaving the kingdom and palaces and responsibilities to the heir apparent normally they used to declare the eldest son as the next ruler king or emperor so all the preparations were ready for this ceremony for crowning the young prince as the next king the previous night he died according to one version due to snake bite anyway he died so it was a great tragedy they had only one son and the subjects the citizens the ministers the queen the king all of them got terribly upset nobody could console them and finally a great sage appeared there a famous sage of those days name was narada and he tried to console these uh, uh, a, a royal couple this king and queen but he couldn't do that they kept weeping and crying and then he said look here i will i will i will demonstrate something before you of course before that he tried to tell them look here life is not just a uh, journey that begins with a with with the birth and ending with death death is only a creative crisis it is only a semicolon or a comma it is not a full stop after death every individual will be reborn again and this son of yours was the son of some other people some other parents in his previous life and the next life he will be the son or daughter of some other parents this is only by accident that for 25 years he happened to live under your son in this life so you don't there is not much for you to worry about but uh, he could not console the royal couple finally he told them well i am going to demonstrate the truth of what i said just now so he revived the prince and the prince came back to life as if he was asleep he woke up and then he looked around then the sage told him look here you console your father and mother and your ministers 
your citizens. They are crying and weeping. They are upset. You are the only son and if you die, if you go away now, the kingdom will, 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 will face this terrible calamity. There will be anarchy. There will be total confusion. There will be no, uh, no ruler after your father passes away. But the prince asked one question to the sage. Which parents are you talking about? I had innumerable parents in the past. Maybe thousands of them are lining up in his mind. Because when he passed away from this life, he, he uh, merged back in, into his total personality. We slowly evolving. He had gone through innumerable lives as sons or daughters of innumerable parents. And immediately the king understood the truth of what he was trying to convince him. The sage was trying to convince him. Now, Vedanta says life is not one. Life is a continuous process. Whether you believe in reincarnation, resurrection or whether you believe in, in the idea that life is one which begins with birth and ends with hellfire or heaven, whatever it is, in reality, Vedanta says, life continues. That's the only way for us to explain some of our own inherent tendencies and impressions. Now, how do we deal with this problem of life? Real life is an intelligent preparation for death. Death is not, a, as I said earlier, death is only a transition point. Death is not something terrifying. You are not afraid if you have to you have five hours layover in another airport on the way from here, San Francisco to New York. You don't be terrified. Similarly, this is a transition point. But this journey is affected by two important doctrines, two important facts. One is action and its result. Second, the fact of continued existence of our real personality. And when we understand this, then we continue our pursuit of Something higher, but not pursuit of sensory happiness, worldly pleasures, true happiness. Now, true happiness is nothing but, what I said earlier, the manifestation of perfection already in all of us. Vivekananda said, the education is the manifestation of perfection already in us. Now, what is this perfection? To give a clearer picture, I must quote the other definition that Vivekananda gave, the way he defined religion. Religion is a manifestation of divinity already in man. So both divinity and perfection are already in us. They do not come from outside. So our journey is nothing but a journey back home, a journey back towards our own true nature which is essentially divine. That's why already is a word that should be underlined. It doesn't come from outside. It is not even a gift of God. Because what we, what we, what we get is only what we earn. What, what, we are, what we get from outside may not always be ours. What we have inherently within ourselves, is ours. So, Swami Vivekananda said, this reality is already within us. Now, there is an interesting dialogue in another Upanishad. How this fact is explained? I mean, this divinity that is within us all. Our prayer, our meditation, our reading of holy scriptures, our listening to great lectures, these are all very helpful, very important, very relevant means to 
bring out bring out this inherent inner divinity we need something we need some instruments we need a vehicle for traveling from one place to another place similarly we need some instruments some means to reach a higher goal in the brihadaranya upanishad there is an interesting dialogue on this very subject this inner divinity which the upanishad calls the inner light antar jyoti or jyotisham jyoti the light of lights or the inner light it is in the form of a dialogue a king and a great sage the king also is a great he is not a, not an ordinary king he was a philosopher king i mean the type of philosopher kings that play to describe about in the republic and other works now here um, when the sage appeared in the court the king puts him one question how do we pe- how do we people move about how are we able to do things in normally in i mean now how do we move about how do we sit apparently you know, the first four questions may appear to be somewhat uh, puerile but when you reach a, when we reach the fifth question and its answer then everything becomes clear so when this question was put to the sage question was this how do we move about what light helps us to move about to sit and work and normally the sage said naturally it is sunlight then the king replied well that's true you are right then he put another question when the sun sets in the west what light helps you naturally moonlight suppose there is no moonlight no moon neither sunlight nor moonlight what light helps you to do your work in your room or maybe to move about in the countryside and the sage said well it is agnir jyoti which means the light in the form of fire so light that comes from the sun then the light that comes from the moon and the third the light that comes from the fire here the light is very important the meaning of light is very significant very profound in this upanishad light is not this light that we see in front of us so then the fourth question suppose there is no sunlight there is no moonlight and you cannot strike a matchstick how do you come to know of things taking place around you a vehicle is moving in the street you can't see that because there is no sunlight no moonlight there is no torch of candle or anything fire nothing then the sage replied it is vak jyoti shabda jyoti means light in the form of speech sound suppose we sit here in a dark room we, our eyes are closed and we come to know of a vehicle that moves in the street we naturally come to know of the existence of such a thing such an object in the street because it makes a noise so we recognize that there is a vehicle moving in the street when we hear the sound that comes from it so there no speech let noise a voice that becomes the light so what is light here not a light that we see necessarily but the light that reveals something what's the function of light the function of light is that it reveals something and there is another function it reveals itself other things get revealed when there is light and we also know that there is light so there are two functions first we first of all know there is light then we know there are certain other objects which are revealed by the light so light is the revealer light is also the revealed but then the fifth question well suppose 
you are deep asleep there is no sunlight no moonlight it's a dark room your eyes are closed no voice coming from anywhere because you are deep asleep and then you come to the dream state and you see different objects or you sit quiet in waking state close your eyes different memories and images that you have gathered in the mind stuff reappear in the mind stuff in the mind both smriti and nidra sopna are the same dream and memories have the same quality in vedanta philosophy both are recollections in subtle form what we experienced in gross form are recollected and relived and re-experienced in subtle form that's what is called memory and that's what is called uh, uh, dream see given to give an example you you suppose you are a student of music you listen to a listen to your teacher and then in the evening or maybe the whole day you may be practicing it within your mind all many great musicians are uh, grown, born of this great skill inherent skill they go on repeating these songs or music or the tone whatever it is the musician has left and gone back to his home and you have come you are returned from the music academy but you are rehearing the same music the same song somewhere but sound waves are not coming to your ears but you re re-experience the music the song that's why you are able to repeat here ears are not involved you don't see the musician mind alone projects a previously gathered experience in subtle form and you hear the music again if you are seen if you are a pay, if you are a fan of Uh, painting then you can recreate very vividly the picture that you have seen in that gallery maybe 10 years back you may see the same thing in dream as well now the point is here there is some other inner light that reveals everything it is not sound because as i said in the case of musician the musician left long back you may even um, keep repeating your mind a song that you learned from your um, teacher music teacher 10 years back he may have passed away still you hear you keep hearing it again within your system so how does this happen so there is another light which is called consciousness atman or brahman within us so one question is finally put to the sage which unfolds the whole philosophy of vedanta the reality is within us swami vivekananda said the manifestation of divinity already within that divinity is this light so here the light should not be misunderstood to be the electric light or the flashlight or anything light is that which reveals itself and light is that which reveals everything else so the point that's why we came to light it was brought to light which means it was revealed so here the sage is put another question by the king the king asks one question there is no sunlight no moonlight no fire and no voice you may be deaf still you remember things you come to know things how does this happen so yajnavalkya uh, the great sage his answer is this atma jyoti this atma jyoti is the real jyoti jyoti means light light means something that reveals everything and reveals itself because light is its nature revealership it is inherent characteristic of light light doesn't um, borrow light from anything else see a hot iron borrows heat from fire a hot water a glass of hot water borrows heat also from fire but the light doesn't borrow its ability to reveal things from another source so 
this atma jyoti the inner light is the ju is the light of all lights it's called that is called andar jyoti or jyotisham jyoti light of all other lights all other lights function with the help of borrowed light but this light is the real light that's why it is this atman which really is our true nature so once we realize this truth then the whole question of life and death everything becomes simple in fact they become totally irrelevant right now it may appear to be a high metaphysical doctrine which is wonderful if you could practice it but unfortunately things are different so vedanta comes to your help it says you need even if you have not reached the experience level of this fact if you keep this idea somewhere with in your pockets and live in this world then it helps us to answer many questions that we had to confront in our everyday life in our private life tragedies sorrows sickness other problems and also problems that come out of our interactions with other people all these will be and can be understood as relative phenomena all these can be understood as part of life in this relative world but the real light is within us all otherwise there is always a danger if we interpret life as a blind pursuit of happiness the tragedy is happiness always evades us this happiness never becomes reality of course we by we, we often uh, equate uh, pleasure with happiness pleasure is different happiness is different happiness is a higher inner deeper experience which is closer to contentment pleasure is often the other side of pain it doesn't come independently it is interdependent pleasure and pain both come together every pleasurable experience contains within it an element of pain because the moment we lose that pleasurable experience it becomes pain but then we go for happiness the real happiness according to vedanta is possible only when we recognize this inner light i shall conclude this talk today uh, with another narrative from the same classic this is world famous that's also about a king and emperor uh, there was a great king uh his name was parikshit i won't go into the details of the story i have referred to this briefly on earlier occasions so i shall just refer to one important aspect this king happened to uh commit a, a serious sin and in what happened he uh, he was walking in the forest he was hungry and thirsty he entered a hermitage there he found a sage sitting absorbed in meditation the king was normally he was known as a great uh, virtuous ruler and emperor but then because he was hungry and thirsty he became somewhat upset he lost his balance and the sage was sitting in sitting absorbed in meditation so the king expected the sage to drink to give him some drinking water because he was thirsty he wanted to ask him he asked but the sage could not respond because he was absorbed in meditation the king got the, the king got angry and looked around he found a dead snake lying near the hermitage he took it with this bow and put it on the neck of the sage and went away and after some time this the sage's son most of the sages you should remember need some explain they were not monks they were mostly great meditators great spiritual seekers who had led the life of householders and when they when they got old 
they normally retire to forest hermitages wife and husband both and they spend the rest of the lifetime in meditation thinking of god this this was the tradition in vedic times so this sage was such a uh, great uh, spiritual seeker so he was absorbed in meditation so anyway the boy came this no, he was not a boy of course he came and he found his uh, there is a dead snake lying on the neck of his father and he cursed the king or anybody he didn't know it was the king who had done it but he cursed the person who had committed such a heinous crime uh, the one anyone who may have done this will die of snake bite uh, within a period of 7 days that is the curse anyway the pain and anguish that he felt within him became a curse anyway and after some time the sage opened his eyes and then the son told him what he had done he had cursed anyone who may we don't know who had done it but the person who had committed such a heinous crime in putting a dead snake on the neck of a person who was meditating on god so the sage was very much upset very sad you should not have done it the king it was a king who had done it through his spiritual power he could understand it was king parikshit who had done it so the say the sage said yes you committed a very serious mistake you should not have done it if the king dies the whole kingdom will become uh, uh will go into anarchy so he sent messengers to the king with this information now that's now we are beginning the real the significant part of the story when the king received this message coming from the sage about this curse it means he was going to die within 7 days and he was a powerful king, emperor with vast with a vast empire confronts everything and he suddenly gets the shocking news he had only 7 days to live after seven, within 7 days he will die he was not upset he was not sad he became wiser so a tragedy the and the most uh, terrible tragedy that all normal human beings become afraid of which scares away everyone which frightens people became an education for him he became wiser than before he said well i deserve this because i committed a mistake i should not have done such a heinous crime therefore i deserve this curse and he said now how am i going to live the rest of my life 7 days 7 into 24 hours so to speak what he did he he called his son janameja another next heir apparent and the subjects and ministers and told them about his intention to uh, declare his son as the next emperor next ruler and he decided to uh, retire to the banks of ganga the holy river in those days and spend the rest of his lifetime on contemplation with a happy serene face in fact the one of the commentators of the bhagavata purana it comes in the first skanda from 1819th uh, chapter you find it comes in the first book of bhagavata purana so uh, some commentators said the king's face shone with light intelligence and wisdom and piety the, these are all you know the, uh, the commentators ways of explaining how the king became all the more wiser when he came to know of this tragedy and he retired the uh, ganga banks of ganga and he uh, started meditating this is how it happened and when the great saints and sages of those days came to know of this event they wanted to see this king because they felt here is a man who understood the real meaning of life 
the real meaning of life is the an intelligent preparation for death because if we don't prepare our life properly death becomes a fearsome a frightening a scary experience if we can learn our lessons even before it comes then we can leave this world with a smile as it happened in the case of this king parikshit so when different sages and saints and philosophers of those times assembled on the banks of ganga got they have come to meet him he puts one question to them he he asked अथ पृछाम संसिधि योगिना परम गुरु पुरुष शेख यम मृयमाण से दिस इज दि दि संस्कृत वर्ड्स विच ऐ शू एक्सप्लेन ऐ एम गोयिंग टू आस्क यू वन इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन यू आर् द ग्रेट टीचर ऑफ ग्रेट गुरु हि वॉज अड्रसिंग हिस् क्वेश्चन द ग्रेट से ऑफ दोस् टाइम्स हिस् नेम शुक purusha seha yatkaryam riyamana si sarvadha the meaning is this what should a dying man do what should a person who is staring at death who is approaching it what should such a person do maybe the most profound question that one could ask because the real mystery of life is not different from the mystery of death so in answer to this uh, the great sage unfolds a high metaphysical spiritual philosophy in the life with the help of the story the life and teachings of lord krishna this how this huge spiritual classic was written so the whole classic spiritual classic known as bhagavata purana is nothing but an answer an elaborate descriptive analysis of the problem of life which is not different from the problem of death because there is always within all human beings a lurking fear fear is as much a reality of human existence as anything else fear of sickness for the healthy person fear of loss of money for the rich man fear of the loss of reputation for a well known person so fear of near and dear ones and so on fear is a reality of human existence in the relative plane and the worst and the most terrible fear is the fear of the loss of everything which means death now vedanta says if the most terrible most fearsome reality of life namely death itself is not so much of a scary experience then all other fears practically become insignificant so the answer that this says gives to the king is this one should spend one's time one's life to realize the supreme inner light either through the path of unselfish action or through the path of devotion or through the path of philosophical analysis the answer is given in the second book the sixth verse that means janma labha para pumsam ante narayana smriti what should be the last goal of human life the ability to leave this world with with a sweet smile on your face with god's name in your heart that is the uh, real destination of human existence and this you can do either through the practice of unselfish action practicing total unselfishness surrender of all our actions as an offering to god or for the good of others or through prayer and meditation or if you don't believe in god or anything just look around see 
and observe and analyze the whole phenomenon of universe everything comes and goes so behind this changing phenomena there should be change, changeless absolute ultimate reality what's that reality this philosophical analysis will take you to the highest destination there is this inner light within us so that means life itself becomes a pleasurable and enjoyable journey all days uh, twists and turns and tragedies and sorrows and undesirable experiences traffic jams everything in this life becomes a tolerable experience we can take them in our stride because the life itself is by its very nature is imperfect the world is imperfect in the sense it is changing but we are moving towards a higher reality with the inner light inner consciousness and this reality is what we call god what is called god in all traditional religions monotheistic religions so the most conflicting question that we ask to ourselves that we put to ourselves what is life is it mere existence is it guided by predeterminism is it mere accident or is it an inexplicable natural phenomenon all these questions finally answered can be answered by this profound answer that comes from vedanta that is light is sorry life is nothing but a journey back home towards our true nature the manifestation of divinity already within all of us and this divinity is called jyoti sham jyoti the light of all lights in the bhagavadnika upanishad and if we can keep this idea in mind as shiramakrishna said the highest most profound truth may not be always easy for us to practice we may feel it's a remote distant goal but as an idea as a concept if we can keep in our pockets then whenever there is a problem there is a tragedy we can constantly remind ourselves of this profound truth then it comes as a consolation thank you namaskar om shanti 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 hari om tat sat sri ram krishna namaste